happy to have uh, Gabe here. Uh, so I know Gabe from London, we evolved a bit and we were climbing together. Um, at the time, uh, Gabe was at DeepMind. Uh, he, studied, he did a um, thesis in Paris, am I correct? Please correct me. And, uh, and was in, uh, was in uh, DeepMind doing uh, RL, uh, still doing that. Now not at DeepMind, he's still at Google. Uh, I thought you were at Brain, but it says Google Research. I don't know. No, it's just the wrong slides, but it's Brain is not an external branding concept anymore, so it's Google Research. <laughs> it's Google. <laughs> Google Research. Uh, so uh, I like to say um, you were you had the the COVID lifestyle before COVID in the sense that you were working from home <laughs> way bef before we all we all did uh, back in the south of France. Um, so yeah, you're going to talk to us about research uh, and uh, your, what's quite nice about what um, you've been doing lately. Uh, uh, you had this um, quite visible work on uh, optimization of, uh, of cooling system uh, at Google, uh, who's been, uh, correct me again, live uh, working and as that has been outsourced lately, have I seen, to help uh, other ones do that. Uh, and lately you were quite uh, also engaged with uh, project with the real world, uh, with uh, actually tracking uh, that system for ICU in, with COVID and uh, organizing competition with like the national grid in France, which I found quite cool. And uh, so you have this um, many facets to your work, but today you're gonna talk to us about uh, RL, um, offline learning, model-based RL, something in between. And uh, uh, up to you now. Great, Thank, thanks Vincent for the introduction. Uh, I, I didn't realize I did all this stuff, amazing. <laughs> um, so th this will be sort of a two-part presentation. Uh, the first is on our recent framework for real-world reinforcement learning um, uh, benchmarking. So to take the, I'll, I'll start um, to make sure it's clear. When we say real-world RL, I'm going from like a team in uh, Dave Silverland doing video games and saying, look, we need to look at problems that are a little closer to the real world. Um, so we're, we're adding in sort of high-level concepts into the MDP that we often have seen in real-world environments. Um, but clearly, it's not the real world in the sense that like we're not simulating um, very specific contact frictions or uh, some very particular type of joint degradation in a robot. Um, this has been a point of contention in the past. I think for core RL, real world means kind of this kind of stuff. But for roboticists, for example, this will sound uh, very, very not real. Um, bear with me until we find a better name for this. Uh, cool. And, and feel free, I don't mind being interrupted if there are questions. And then if they seem like they'll be too long, I'll just say we can push them to the end. So feel free to cut in whenever you want. It's relatively informal. Uh, so we we went through and sort of, when I was at DeepMind for, for three years, there was a, a lot of different tasks we looked at. Um, and uh, with some colleagues from DeepMind, so Todd and Dan, we sort of long kind of had a presentation that was the, the pain points of RL algorithms where they just wouldn't work in real systems. Um, and we'd kind of come up with these challenges uh, that we list here, and so I'll just list them orally as well, but uh, limited samples, so like you, you don't often have that much data from a system. Um, systems don't react immediately, so your reward signal, your actions and stuff don't arrive right away. Um, they're often high dimensional, either in the state or the action space, especially the discrete action space, which can be maybe hundreds of millions of actions in certain cases. Um, systems often have constraints that you want to be able to respect uh, and want to be able to, ranging all the way to like absolutely have to or your solution is not useful. Um, they're almost always partially observable. So you know you don't really know what's going on. So there's obviously some uncertainty on your observations, on your actions, um, and even sort of on what the system's internal workings are. Um, might be a mystery. So in like a recommender system, for example, you're interacting with a user, and so there's absolutely no way that you can have full observability of, of a user's state. Um, there's often almost always multiple objectives. So some team will come say, like, we want to optimize for this, but we also don't want to reduce that. And it'd be great if this were also up, but not this thing down. And so that's sort of not the standard RL setup. And you don't see it that often in, in a sort of core research, but it's actually a really interesting one. It is real in almost all practical cases. There's rarely ever just a single number you want to optimize for. Um, another one that you know we've looked at a lot and that I'll talk about more uh, in the second part 
is offline RL. And so offline RL is the idea that uh, if you have a given system and it's been operating online um, with some sort of operator or, or a black box controller or something, some older system, it's generating data of its operation. That data is probably not optimal, but it's probably somewhat reasonable because it is operated in system. It's not just flailing around. Um, and so how good can you make of a controller given only this data on, on disk without ever actually interacting with the system? And this is sort of a really interesting task because it, it, research-wise, it makes a lot of things simpler. You now you just have these nice fixed data sets so you can really compare algorithms, um, understand what's working, what's not, really dig into things a lot more. And practical-wise, uh, you know, if I can give you a data set of a system's operations and you can return a policy that just functions um, without ever having interacted with the actual system, uh, that opens up a lot of doors in terms of actually using reinforcement learning-like methods or learn controllers in, in real systems. And then the last point, which is a lot harder to, to synthesize, is explainability. Um, and so obviously, a lot of these things, you're interacting with non-technical end users, or they may be technical in another domain. And so they're going to say, oh, you know, well, can we like see what's going on? And you're sitting there with your like ResNet 18, like, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know, uh, no. And so that's obviously a really big schism when they're not sort of understanding the techniques that you just say, you know, I don't really know why it's doing this. Um, and so if we can make RL more explainable, at least in, in terms of its intents and the ways it's understanding and, and what it's, it's using in terms of information for forming decisions, this is important you know, both for trust and also for sort of a legal liability down the road as well. You know, if, and this is you know, with no, absolutely no context. I don't work with uh, Waymo in any way. But if you had like a, a self-driving car and then it has some sort of RL system and there is some accident, then maybe like a, you'd want to be able to say, well, at least here's you know, those steps that the system took. And we actually understand them, and we can explain them. Um, and that's not always the case with, with our current RL approaches. And so these are sort of very important and very interesting topics that you know, we really do need to deal with as RL researchers if we want to see RL work in real systems. And so the the goal here uh, was sort of we first defined these in, in a first sort of small workshop paper, and like that's great. Anyone can you know write uh, some ideas up on a PDF. Uh, but then we wanted to really go through and implement them to make a benchmark that we can now point people at and say, like, look, you know, here's some implementations of delays that we think are reasonably well done or non-stationarity that we think are reasonably well done. Um, you know, if, if you want to look at real world RL research, like maybe try your hand at getting your algorithm working in these non-stationary scenarios as a very, very first step um, to sort of looking at a real system. But if it can't work with these, it probably will have trouble with the real system. So we developed and open source the real world RL suite. Um, it implements seven of the nine. Actually, I think maybe we did the eighth one really quickly, but it's not the best uh, of the real world challenges. Um, there's five Mujoku environments, which correspond to 12 total tasks. So there's like some environments of three tasks. Uh, and the idea is that we just take these sort of benchmark DM control suite environments that everyone's very familiar with and that are stable and, and work well and for which we have sort of very complete uh, performance benchmarks and they've been thoroughly debugged. And we just wrap them with uh, a code wrapper that will add these different perturbations to simulate these challenges. And then once we uh, implement this, suite, we went through and, and ran uh, D4PG and DMPO, which are two uh, structurally quite different uh, model-free uh, learning algorithms. Um, the D just stands for distributional, so it's basically a DDPG variant and an MPO variant. And we just ran them on these uh, perturb systems, varying the perturbations, just to give an idea of like at what point do delays, so here we'll have some plots later, but here we have a couple little plots. Um, at what point do delays uh, start sort of really affecting the thing, or, or what point is it not really that important? And we didn't actually know, so this was interesting. And so we put this all together in an in a article that we're uh, uh, submitting to a journal, and it's already on archive if you're interested. Um, and so the idea is basically you can just load the suite like this, and you say, you know, oh, I want to add a delay, so I'm going to say delay spec enable, uh, and I want the delay to be on actions, and I want it to last 20 seconds or time steps to check the spec. And then you can sort of run your sweep on this delay value, and you'll see that like for a delay of 20, um, things really do break down. But for delays of 2.5, it's it's more or less OK, depending on the environment. Um, so this is MPO. It's just a uh, less performed version of DMPO. Um, and you can see that like depending on the environment, uh, different values of delays that have more or less effect. And also, depending on the algorithm, so we don't have D4PG, um, you'll have different effects. Uh, and so you can do other things like add some noise spec, and we have some different ways that noise can get stuck, and this is all described in the docs. Um, 
And so you can make these little plots that say, like, you know, depending on the duration of this observation getting stuck and the probability of it getting stuck, here's the effects on, on system performance during training. Um, and obviously, you could also train on a non-perturbed system and then evaluate on this. We didn't do that, but that, that would be a, another reasonable thing to do. Um, and so we have different sort of uh, variants of, uh, of the challenges that you can then implement and try out. Um, so I won't go through the slides one by one. Um, if this is something that interests you, you know, have a look at the paper. Um, I'll show you a little video. So this is like we defined some constraints also. Um, so here are the three constraints. The slider has to be between two limits on the, on the track. There's an acceleration limit on the, the cart acceleration. And then there's sort of a weird combined uh, constraint which says that if the pole is within a certain angle of the of uh, the middle, then the velocity has to be below some certain threshold velocity. So we wanted to have not only just box constraints. And so these are just uh, given to you as uh, a binary mask of the violated or not uh, constraints. And you can generate sort of little plots that show um, you know, what, how much you violated a specific constraint and at what point in the, in the uh, environment you violate them. So here we can see like swing up, you tend to violate the balance constraints at the beginning, but once you stabilize the pole, then you don't really uh, violate any constraints. So we have some, some stuff that does that. Um, we can do stuck and drop sensors. We can do some cool non-stationarity. Um, these are supposed to be animated GIFs. Oh, there we go. YouTube videos. So you can easily change the uh, contact friction or the head size on humanoid. You can change length, uh, leg lengths and stuff like that. So if you want to see sort of how robust uh, your algorithm is to changes in system, in system dynamics, or we can also schedule these non-stationarities so that they'll vary according to a schedule like a, a saw wave or some sort of uh, depreciating value that then resets to simulate systems that maybe break down over time and then they get fixed. And so now you have these certain weird jumps in, in the system dynamics and you want your algorithm to be able to track that. Um, and there's all sorts of plots. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what else. Yeah, and so we also define multi-objective rewards. We have an example where we do constraint-based multi-objective rewards, and so we can show that there's like trade-offs between your constraint satisfaction and your performance, or your policy performance, and that after some trade-off, then like the agent starts prioritizing one thing over the other. Um, so this is sort of interesting just to see how these things behave. Um, once again, the goal isn't to simulate a real system, but just to understand sort of how these types of more complicated setups um, will affect uh, your, your, your training um, regime. Uh, and then we have a, a nice offline data set that I like where we uh, took a 70% performant DMPO agent on a couple of tasks and generated both uh, non-perturbed examples and then also perturbed examples where we have kind of a, a benchmark set of uh, perturbations that are easy, medium, and hard. And we show that we can sort of train um, offline from this data uh, using some CR, which is a, an algorithm by some colleagues at DeepMind. Uh, and then we have sort of some combined challenges, which allow us to see sort of uh, in compare algorithms in sort of a soccer player like plot, where you can see that like Gaussian observation noise really affects stuff way more than action noise, um, and that like increasing observation dimensions has really no effect. And so it's interesting to look at sort of an algorithm when you're developing it through these different lenses. And this is really complementary to stuff uh, by uh, Ian Osband and some other people at DeepMind uh, on a task called B Suite, which looks at sort of a whole other array of, of perturbations and complexities in, in standard environments. But it, it's really important to look at these learning algorithms under a multifaceted lens and not just as like which one gets to maximum performance the first, because that's in practice not really what you care about. Um, yeah, and there's some related works and limitations. I'll just stop the recording, or sorry, stop my screen share two seconds or pause it while I just swap to the other slides. Um, doo -doo -doo. And so actually, if there are any questions on this first part, it would make sense to maybe ask them now, because um, the second part will be uh, entirely about model-based offline planning. And we'll talk a bit about constraints and offline RL in that part, um, but I won't come back on the sort of the other uh, specificities of the, um, the real-world RL suite, which is, I, I think I mentioned it, but it's on GitHub and sort of available to, to download and it's easy, easy to use, I hope. Perhaps uh, I could. Uh... I have a question. So uh, given that you have some, uh, some experience in applying reinforcement learning and learning in real world environment, um, so in your experience out of these challenges, so probably there are some that are more important than the others. 
I, I love all the challenges equally, but I think offline RL and constraints are the ones that I, I am most excited about. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on offline RL uh, this last year uh, in Google Research. And so there's a bunch of great work from colleagues uh, in Mountain View and some other work from colleagues in DeepMind uh, and some work from me <laughs> that, that has been really uh, addressing these issues and showing that, you know, through, uh, and, and also, you know, some people from Berkeley as well showing that you can uh, really do a good job at learning from the data if you constrain your uh, Bellman function updates to be reasonable. So a lot of the reason that the offline is, is hard and this kind of seeks into this talk is that if you just look at the data and you do something like a Bellman update, uh, at some point you're going to be doing this argmax over the cube function and you're going to say, look, uh, give me the best action that you think I should take. And inevitably, that uh, max is not going to be a part of the support of your training data. And so you're going to start querying the function for stuff that it sort of has no legitimacy to talk about. And you're not only going to do that, you're actually going to back up that value into the Q function itself through the bootstrap. And you're going to start sort of deviating um, completely from reality and having these sort of completely insane estimations of, of your Q value and that will totally start ignoring sort of the, the real system dynamics. Uh, and so by penalizing these updates, um, we've seen that you, know, you already fixed that quite a bit. Uh, so I think offline is, is really cool because it opens up a lot of doors in terms of actually running RL on, on real systems where you just have a, some data and people want a policy and you can't just randomly explore on the system. We're just seeing the beginnings of that. A lot of these papers have you know, one or two years old. Um, so I'm hoping we'll see some cool applications of this stuff in the coming year or two. Uh, and then the constraint-based RL, I think, is, is really important as well because you know, if you want to run real systems, you can't just have it do crazy stuff. And I've definitely uh, heard stories of people, you know, uh, having motors catch on fire on, on robots and stuff like that just because the, the algorithm is overactuating. Uh, and these are things, you know, that in practice don't work. And so if we want to have the stability of something like a Boston Dynamics spot or something like that, where a real robot that interacts in the real system, but it's powered by RL and not by traditional uh, control uh, theory, then, you know, we need to look at, at these two, I think, would, would be some of the, the two main ones. Um, but I'm also happy to hear contradictions. Okay, thanks for the opinion. A quick pr practical question, maybe. Do you use your, your suit as well uh, to train some robust agents? Some people go to the line where they, they want to just uh, actually uh, maybe create multiple data sets with, multi with different non-stationarity, different noise level, and, and be robust to that. Uh, um, yeah, so one of the co-authors, uh, one of the main main authors actually of that, that first paper is Daniel Mankiewicz, and he has some uh, work on robust uh, robust MPO. And so their work came from right before the suite was made, but their follow-up work uses the suite and uses, uh, it should be out soon, uh, and basically leverages the suite's ability to quickly generate a bunch of variations of the environment dynamics to show that you know you can generate a relatively robust policy if you can just train from a more robust uh, field of, of system dynamics. Um, and then if you have certain uh, particular updates, that really try to make you explicitly pessimistic, so you're not just kind of implicitly pessimistic through the expectation, but you're actually sort of explicitly looking at worst case scenarios, you can get even more robust policies that will really avoid the pitfalls of sort of funky corners of this potential system dynamics. Um, so we're definitely using it internally. Um, I've been using the offline part of the suite and the offline data sets quite a bit, um, and, and I think we'll be pushing a couple more ones out uh, and, and looking at the constraint-based uh, aspects as well. So yeah, the goal was to build a tool for ourselves, but to also open source it um, so that people could sort of uh, benefit and, and share the, the common definitions. Cool. One question regarding the explainability. You mentioned at the bottom that does not yet incur explainability and other reference, but what, what is your idea to add explainability in this kind of, of, of benchmarks, how you are going to measure in one of the directions of these plots? Yeah, so definitely, I said we implemented almost all the challenges, and explainability is the one we definitely didn't exp uh, explain or didn't implement. I think uh, automating the evaluation explainability is not impossible, but it's definitely a lot more nuanced than, say, just adding delays or something like that. Um, one approach that does come to mind, and I, I would have to find the citation, is uh, RL algorithms that explain what they're going to do through language such that another algorithm can re-implement the task forget where that paper was. Um, but there, there's some stuff around that where you could basically try to do a, a, teach, a teaching task. So you have to be able to explain what your intention is, and another agent has to be able to replicate it, given that explanation. Um, and that suggests that whatever you're sending out as information of your explanation 
contains a concise enough plan for something else to replicate it. Um, and then if you can make the grounding of that not some sort of high dimensional vector, but a uh, language, uh, like a string of, of natural language characters that are somehow grounded, um, then you can uh, potentially do stuff like that. There's, there's some work by Pierre Sermonet and uh, teaching uh, through language. Um, so he has the, the play, learning to play by playing data set where it's like a kitchen robot. And they've been doing some more recent work uh, integrating language into that and showing actually that they can even extract intentions um, from the, the learn policy. Um, so it's imitation learning based, it's not sort of full RL, but you can, it'll say like, I'm gonna move the blue box into the drawer and then it like moves the blue box into the drawer. Um, so there's actually some interesting, because I think natural language has, has taken a big jump in the last two years, maybe before I would have said, oh, maybe we can find some sort of like projection through the MDP of what it looks like and say if you're going to go to a specific state or not. But now it looks like maybe you could even just have a natural language description of what the agent's intent is. Um, at least that's definitely one way. And how to evaluate that objectively is not something I have a clear answer for, but it's an interesting uh, question. Which is a terrible answer on my part. It's not very helpful. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> cool, cool. Thanks. Any other, or should I? I'll, I'll continue. It's already uh, f almost four twenty-five, so I'll, I'll resume sharing with our more recent work that I'm quite excited about playing with more. Um, so this is model-based offline planning. Uh, the name doesn't. It has all the right keywords. It also accurately out to MBOP, which is an amazing pop song from the 90s, and it uh, uh, winks back at all the other model-based papers that all have terrible titles with four-letter acronyms. So take it for what it is. Um, the goal is that it's model-based, it's working offline, and uh, it's using planning for control. Um, oops, next slide. So I'll, I'll give you sort of, it'll be a bit of a rehash relative to what I already said on offline, but just to make it clear, um, you know, we definitely have seen some impressive performance of RL on simulated systems, and even on some real systems where we have access to a simulator. But a lot of these real systems where we don't have access to a simulator um, have these large data sets uh, that we could leverage. Um, and so like, if you take a, a robot or some sort of industrial system or navigation task, you can't really come online and start actuating stuff randomly. Um, but there is some data set of that system running with maybe some sort of nominal performance that has some headroom, but it's already kind of reasonable. Um, and a lot of these systems do tend to be physical systems with continuous controls. And so the, the, the question that we wanted to look at here was can we leverage model-based methods instead of sort of these model free methods that have this QMAX, the, this argmax on the Q problem, and there's some resolutions around there, but I'll, I'll explain why I think the model-based approach is really interesting. Um, and can we leverage this model-based me uh, methods to be both efficient and to learn sort of adaptable control policies? And, and all of this in sort of a stable way. So this means we're using only supervised learning of like regression targets, mean squared error, feed forward nets, two layers, 500, 500 perceptron layers, like very, very simple stuff, very easy to kind of dig into understand why it's not working, if it's not working, and very quick to train. Um, so an overview of the title. Why model-based? So model-based uh, is sort of in opposition to model-free RL. Uh, now, uh, maybe everyone's an RL expert in the room, but I'll, I'll just say it in case not, not everyone is. Um, the, the nuances of a model-free agent will learn some sort of function that will map directly from states to actions, and the internal mechanism of that function is kind of hidden away, um, whereas a model-based agent will learn a model of the system that will map a state and an action to the next state. Uh, and then there'll be some sort of sampling approach that will go through this model and try to figure out how to leverage it to make a policy. Um, so basically, that means that the actual functional approximators that we learn in this system are just models of the environment, and they're actually relatively agnostic to the task, aside from the fact that the task obviously suggests a certain coverage of the state action space. Um, the offline aspect means that this policy can be learned entirely from log data without any access to the environment. So you don't need that we access the environment only at the end to evaluate. Um, and maybe uh, I'll, I'll say it now because it's kind of cheating, um, but we did also tune our hyperparameters by sampling uh, different hyperparameters on, by evalu or evaluating different hyperparameters on the environment. Um, there's parallel work on how can you sample these, or how can you find good hyperparameters without touching the environment. Um, but in our case, we both showed best performance, and we have sort of uh, sweeps that show how it degrades uh, over the different hyperparameters. Um, and then it's planning. And so there's some uh, similar work where there's 
a model that's trained. So it's Mopo and Moral are these two papers. Um, they'll train a model and then they'll use PPO or SAC and learn a model-free policy on this model and then apply the model-free policy as sort of their resulting policy to the system. And in opposition to that, here we're actually doing planning directly with the model and we're never synthesizing it into a sort of a, a model-free policy, more or less. Um, actually, I think I probably went over this slide orally without meaning to. Um, I don't think I missed anything. Uh, yeah, one nuance is also that a model-based RL algorithm will be adapted to specific tasks. So because it's intrinsically trying to maximize some sort of value function, uh, it's linked to the reward of that task. Whereas a model-based approach, it's just trying to learn the system dynamics, and it can learn or not learn that reward function as sort of a separate function approximator. Um, but the dynamics are consistent. So whether you're trying to kick a soccer ball or juggle a soccer ball or just place a soccer ball, the way the soccer ball interacts with the system around it is going to be the same for a specific interaction. Um, and so this is really interesting because it will allow us to do uh, zero-shot task adaptation later on, as we'll see. Um, yeah, actually, I think I went in a way way deeper than I needed to on these slides. Uh, one of the things that's also interesting is that um, actually, uh, mm, no, I think this is pretty clear. Um, oh, right. Well, I just wanted to make the point that like real systems, you know, rarely can be controlled during learning. Uh, the the lim the safety constraints and the limits, you know, don't really allow you to explore randomly. There isn't. There is some work on sort of more interesting expression strategies that can maybe respect safety constraints and stuff like that, but it's definitely not the mainstream. Um, and like I said, you know, the, these data sets do exist in practice. Um, yeah, so like, it, and the end goal is, yeah, finding optimal policy, leveraging only the data um, before you push the policy to the system. Uh, I also kind of went too quickly early. The mo model free, just to give you an overview, there's two main approaches to do offline RL. There's ways that regularize that you stay on the support in the data. So when you do this argmax, instead of saying, oh, you know, I'm going to take the best action that the Q function proposes, it just says, I'm going to take the best action, but if it's not an action that I've seen in the data, I'm going to strongly penalize that decision and maybe take a, another action, either through some kale divergence or as an explicit penalization. Um, and then there's some other ones that I'm, I prefer, where you're going to actually maybe use an ensemble of value functions, and you're going to uh, rely on the, on the regressors um, uh, accurate or uncertainty measure. Uh, and so if the ensembles agree, you're going to allow that update. But if the ensembles are, are strongly uh, uh, variant in their predictions, you're going to say, mm, it's probably not very confident around the space. I'm not going to apply that backup, backup or I'm going to strongly penalize that backup's application. Uh, I think that's more the right way to do model-free uh, model offline RL, but uh, it's not that many people to take that approach. And then on the model-based side, there's sort of two variants. The Mopo Moral ones, where you take the model to train a model-free policy, and then the MBOP, which I, as far as I know is sort of uh, relatively unique in its approach, where you take that train policy and then uh, plan with it. And so it's unique in the offline world. It's not unique in the model-based RL world. Um, so now to the nitty gritty, I've sort of blah, blah, blah why, why this is interesting. Uh, what do we actually do? So we have this data set of state action reward and next state tuples. Um, they're organized by episodes, so it's really like S, A, S0, A0, R0, S1, uh, A1, R1, so on, until the episode end. And we train three models, which are bootstrap ensembles of feed forward neural nets. Um, one is for the system dynamics, which we call FM, and that takes in the current, uh, uh, so I should have written these the way around, but takes in the current state and action and gives you the predicted reward for that action in that given state and the predicted next state. Then we have a behavior cloning, which we use as a sort of policy prior. Um, it takes in the current state and the previous action. Uh, the previous action trick is a trick from the PDDM paper for, for which, from which we extended the source code. Um, but it does seem to, to provide better uh, behavior clone policies. And then we have a fixed horizon return, which could be seen as sort of a, a value function uh, with a, z a discount of zero. Um, but because we're lazy and we don't want to deal with the bootstrap, and it doesn't really didn't really seem necessary in these tasks. They're quite cyclical. We just have a, a truncated return uh, of horizon H. So let's say we'll be planning out to horizon like 16. Well, maybe we'll have a, a return horizon of like 40 um, to then complement the, the planned horizons. Um, we'll explain that uh, better. But basically, you have three elements, some dynamics, behavior cloning, and fixed horizon return, which you can kind of think of as the, the value function. 
And then now we want to leverage these models, these three function approximators, to somehow control the system. And so that's when we get into sort of the, the model-based planning part. Um, there's sort of two abstractions. The high-level policy is an MPC policy, so it's model predictive control. And what that means is that, actually, let me make sure, yeah, uh, that you're going to take a state T, and you're going to run a trajectory optimizer, which is at this point just a black box. And that trajectory optimizer will take these models and find sort of a, what it believes to be the optimal trajectory uh, through time that will make you closer to your goal, be that your award function or whatever function you want to optimize for. Um, you then take that trajectory. You apply the very first action from that trajectory to the system. You observe how the system responds. And then you replan. Uh, given this new uh, information of ST plus one, basically, uh, and then requery your trajectory optimizer and say, look, uh, actually, I'm now in this new state. Find a new trajectory that leaves this state um, and, and optimizes my reward function. And you just always apply this first action. And you know, in the most basic version of this, you just discard those plans. Um, here, we don't discard the plans. We use them to warm start, this, warm start the search for the, the next round. Uh, but that's sort of MPC. And MPC is very powerful. Um, it's a very simple idea, and it's actually used in practice. So this isn't like a RL trick. This is used in practice in a lot of control systems. And it allows you to use relatively crappy models of the system to achieve uh, close to optimal control. And there's a lot of theory, like there's oodles of theory around why and how. Um, the intuition is just, in my, you know, in my intuition at least, is that by sort of keeping kind of on track the average direction of where you want to be heading using your planner, which you know, makes you not be totally greedy, um, you can then just apply these somewhat greedy actions uh, from the first step of the plan, and it in practice works really well. So this is used in, in a lot of systems, um, and we use it here. The real trick is how do you actually find an optimal trajectory uh, through time that maximizes your reward uh, using these three learned models, which are, you know, like I mentioned, they're two-layer feed-forward neural nets with 500 neurons per layer. So these are pretty crappy models. There's like absolutely nothing fancy going on. Um, and so we're going to see how we can uh, go through these. And this is probably the, the crux. These two sides are sort of the crux of the algorithmic approach. So if you have specific questions on how this works, PPI, for people who are familiar with that, it's um, path integral, model predictive path integral control. Um, and it came out of a, a set of work from uh, Georgia Tech using this for uh, vehicle, ve vehicular control from cameras. Uh, and then it, went on to a series of papers from Anushin Nagavandi, who showed you could actually do a shadow hand manipulation of a robot, of a physical cube on a robot. And then we've extended it and added in sort of the behavior clone prior policy and the, the value function um, to make it even more stable in the offline scenario. And so the, the idea is pretty straightforward. You go through and you sample an action from your behavior clone prior on line 10. Uh, actually, I think if, oops, if I do this, you can see my pointer. Um, and then if you take this action and you mix it in with your previous trajectory, which initializes at zero, um, but this stabilizes it through time, and you add this action into an action buffer, and now you apply that action uh, given the current uh, simulated. Sorry, uh, oops, I always get confused. We need to put a hat on this one, I believe. So consider that all these S's are hats. They're uh, imagined states. They're not true states. Um, so then you take the current imagined state and the predicted action. You pass it in through your model. And you get a new imagined state, t plus 1. And you loop this out to some horizon h. And so that's sort of the most simple thing you can do. You just take your behavior clone policy. You perturb this action a little bit. You mix in with this previous uh, predicted action for that time step. And you flip it through your state model. And you get these new states, predict the actions. And along with that, you can also predict the reward. And so this is just a trick to take the average reward over the ensembles. And here we take a single ensemble head to be consistent. Um, we can talk more about that afterwards. And you just accumulate the reward uh, here. And then you cap that. Oh, yeah, so the state, the environment model returns both state and reward. Um, that's why we have a S index here and an R index, but it's the same neural net. And then we accumulate the reward through that first horizon h. And at the end, once you've simulated the, the trajectory out to h, we'll pop on to the end this predicted value function starting at that final state sh, um, and an implicit and that last action ah. And that adds an implicit planning horizon of, let's say, you know, another um, k steps, whatever we use to train this function. 
Um, and so now we have basically a stack of trajectories through, this, through the space and a stack of returns. And we can reweight, and this is the MPPI loss, we re-rate the uh, trajectories between each other using an, an exponential weighting on the return of each trajectory. So if a specific trajectory has a high return, it'll get weighted a lot more strongly in the, in the averaging. And if another trajectory has a lower return, it'll get strongly abated. Um, obviously, this has a strong power on the fact that this is a continuous control task, and it's not some sort of like highly discontinuous space, because otherwise it would make absolutely no sense to average uh, trajectories together. Um, with this creates your new final trajectory, which you return, and then you apply the first action from that, and then this whole loop repeats. Um, Can I ask you? I'm happy to fill some questions at this stage. Uh, Gabriel, can you hear me? Oh, I've never seen before yep. this sort of mixing of uh, trajectory with the beta, and uh, what is it actually doing, and what, what's this tra trajectory you select to, have, to mix it with? Yeah. So T. Yeah. So the line eleven is basically taking uh, the trajectory from the past step of MPC. So if for a step like the, if we have just a a, a Markov chain like state zero, you run out of prediction, you come back, uh, and then now you have a trajectory for state zero, which we call T zero. Then for state one, you're going to rerun out a trajectory and come back. We'll call that T one. So that's this new trajectory. Well, while T1 is being created, it's getting mixed in with this beta parameter with the choices that were made during T0. So basically, we offset. Um, it's kind of hidden here, but when you pass, when you call the trajectory optimizer, you give it T to the T minus 1. So we basically offset uh, by one step the trajectory. And so now you can basically, for that given time step that you were predicting for at your previous trajectory optimization step, you can keep that information around, and now that you're going to be predicting a new action, you mix the two together with this better parameter, basically to stabilize and sort of uh, do some sort of um, uh, divergence minimization through through each sort of step of trajectory planning. Um, this isn't a contribution of ours; it was done that way in PDDM, and I believe that's from the MPPI uh, algorithm in general. Uh, I don't recall if we tried setting beta to zero or to see if it like really matters that much. Uh, it might not be all that important. Um, but probably depends like, on the on the environment. Uh, I have another question. Um, so I'm not sure about the role of behavioral cloning policy here. I mean, usually what you do with MPC is you optimize actions to uh, get as high reward as possible. So what are you actually optimizing here, if you're not if you're using app actions from behavioral cloning policy? So the the Gaussian above it is not the, the the variance term is not that small. So you're perturbing these actions and basically you're allowing it to deviate from what the behavior clone policy would have done otherwise. Um, you're also re well. So in this case, I guess you'll you'll get a different sample. So you're running this. Uh, this um, this horizon loop like maybe 500 to 1,000 times. And so you're going to get different predictions for ST. And so you're going to get different predictions for AT because of that. So you're, and, and I, I will readily admit that sort of what's actually happening here theoretically requires a little more thought. Uh, empirically, we know it helps because we did a bunch of ablations where we like just use the BC or also add the planning or also add the value function. And we see this sort of really when you combine the three, it, it's quite performant. But if you just have one or two, it, it doesn't quite get the same performance. Um, the BC prior, as we'll see in the plots, is already a pretty good prior for control. But it's strongly stabilized by the fact that you go through this planning step. And the, the, variance, the variance comes both from the epsilon and from the uncertainty around your choice of, of model. So you're actually picking a different ensemble head at each horizon or module OK, a different ensemble head at each at each rollout. And so what this probably ends up doing is that you have all these slightly different paths. They're relatively confined to a tube of what your behavior clone policy would have done anyways. But you're fine tuning them through the MPPI mixture to sort of concentrate on the ones that you think will be sort of the most uh, performant. And these sort of what would you think intuitively be relatively small changes to the policy trajectory um, are non-negligible in terms of the return. Uh, we haven't looked at videos of like 
if you don't plan, if you plan more, what like what it actually looks like. Um, but I think that would be an interesting path to go down. And this is like a very empirical work. So this is more sort of the intuition was traditionally the way you'd start this action sampling is that you'd have this Gaussian that you'd sort of fit over time uh, to just a uh, fixed initial action sampling space. And then your epsilon had to be quite wide for that to make sense. And that seemed kind of silly because in a lot of these cases, like a Gaussian over your action space doesn't seem like the right thing to sample from. So we just flipped in this uh, behavior clone prior and it empirically worked well from the start. So we kind of pushed forward with it. Um, clearly the next step is to kind of go through and understand how much is this action getting perturbed, get some distributional estimations of this, and also see like if there's some more clever things we can do. Uh, so I agree with your uh, dubiousness. Um, mechanically, that's why it's sort of not the same is because there's both the, the uncertainty around the model prediction and the epsilon. But I also agree that there's like, it's maybe kind of uh, requires a little more analysis to understand if this is really the, the right thing to be doing. So I guess one uh, thing that, it, uh, that this does is it keeps the new policy close to what has been seen in the training in the offline data, right? So it kind of... So this is one of the strong, like we'll, we'll do, we do zero task, zero shot task transfer afterwards. And clearly if we try to do task transfer with these, it works less well than if we remove the behavior clone prior and just give it some sort of Gaussian prior and then do task transfer. Um, you'll see in the, in the videos, like it, when you try to tell the quadruped to go backwards, even though it's trained them going forwards, it kind of looks like a dog going backwards. Like it's clearly not uh, very comfortable with it. Um, but at the same time, the BC helps it accelerate the training on the original task. So it, then it's like up to you to remove the parts uh, or, or not. And if, if you have a lot of data, you can get rid of the BC. If you have very little data, you kind of need the BC for it to work. That was, was also our empirical takeaway. I guess my, I had a similar comment to Avoye, which was uh, this seems to work when you have a, a data that actually already solves the task quite well. Yeah, yeah, so this is clearly oriented towards tasks where you have sort of somewhat performant systems that you want to then milk to get like an extra 30%. So here all, all our examples, or almost all of them, use a 70% a performant uh, controller. So that means that in practice that it's getting the reward and it's moving the system relatively along the lines, but you want to really fine tune the system to make it really smooth and clean and, and make it work really well. Then a method like this will find sort of a better policy that will follow the same general trajectory as the original system, but sort of clean up all the corner cases and, and make it work uh, cleanly. We clearly, if we have random data, um, Have we lost Gabriel? Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> it just kicked me out. Um, share my screen. Well, you said oh. your screen 30% sounds quite impressive. I thought you were going to say uh, scratch uh, a 2% more, you know? Do you actually? No, no, yeah. so you get 30% improvement, um, which, is, which is cool. Um, but you need like somewhat reasonable data to start off with for now. Ultimately, it would be nice to be able to function with random data, um, but it, we haven't gotten to work out of the box yet. And it's not necessarily our priority, because in practice, that's not what the tasks that we're dealing with have as situations. Like generally, it's kind of kind of working. And maybe like, let's say we have a robotics task. There's like a black box control that someone coded to make the robot walk. And it's like somewhat functioning, but it's not clean, not very robust, not very general. Well, can we offload that hand-coded black box into a neural net policy to now make it adaptable and more robust um, and that's sort of the kinds of things that I, I'd like to play with with, with this. But I, it's good. I'm glad you. It means that my explanation was uh, clear, or at least the, the slide was clear, because this is like an important nuance to pick up on. There's a really strong prior in this approach to the existing data, um, and it's less strong than a model-free approach, but it's not as weak as we would like it to be, which would be you know zero prior. One question regarding the behavior cloning. It seems a little bit tricky because basically what you are doing is, uh, my understanding is that you're inverting the dynamics, right? And then, but the dynamics might not be invertible. In other words, there, you could achieve the same as future state with different actions for a given. So in that case, I assume that if you get, for instance, policy, if you suppose that two operators have different preferences, but they are able to operate the machine 
in the same stable or even optimal regime, right? And if you want to learn from both, it will be very tricky because the neural network or whatever method you use to approximate the dynamics will have to jump between two opposite approaches. Is that correct? Yeah, so that, that's very true. And I think these tasks are, are not very rich in describing these kinds of things. There's, there's two places this breaks down. One is this is just a standard mean squared error regression. So if you have a multimodal distribution of actions for the same state, and it's just like two paths that kind of join later on, um, the, yeah, like it's not going to do a good job of, of learning that at all. Um, and also even worse is when you do this uh, action averaging uh, in line 17, um, if you have two completely different trajectories and sort of the average of these trajectories is very bad, then this is probably going to give you a terrible suggestion of what to do. Um, so in these relatively smooth and uh, kind of uh, locomotion-oriented tasks, this doesn't seem to be too much of an issue, but it's definitely an issue if you're going to have like an operator and one sort of enjoys uh, uh, accelerating some something and then turning something off, the other one turns something off and then accelerates it. Well, you don't want the average to be turning everything off uh, and then not accelerating or something like this, um, which like the the reward function would, I think the first part of the algorithm wouldn't find these bad trajectories, but this averaging here would definitely sort of average stuff in unreasonable ways. And one of our uh, desires is to get rid of this thing with maybe a more learned approach because this doesn't make much sense. Um, it makes a lot of sense control theory wise, like there's a whole PhD thesis on why this is optimal relative to some criteria. But in practice, uh, the hypotheses I think that they hold out to find this optimality are not stuff that we'd sort of consider to be maybe the, the right hypotheses. So yeah, I do take this as like a first step of an algorithm. And I think every single one of these lines should be replaced, <laughs> ultimately. OK, thanks. But it's a good direction for future research. Um, So yes, yeah, so that's, that's this. Uh, any more questions on the trajectory optimization step? Uh, can I ask one question? Yes, uh, please. Uh, have you heard of uh, Poplin, the algorithm? Yeah, so Poplin, I, so I went through all of these uh, while we were uh, writing the paper. So I, correct me if I'm wrong, Poplin does value function extended planning? I think it, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it, it conceptually is trying to do something uh, similar, but it's uh, of course not an of policy algorithm. So um, it also has a planner and it distills the planner as it goes and uses it for planning, basically. Okay, so it's distilling into sort of a, a model free approach or uh, some sort of imitation learning controller uh, while it's planning. Well, it's a decision time planner, and the decision time planner is spitting out action as, it's go as it goes, right? And then it just collects a data set of that and distills it and uses that policy for the virtual planning rather than doing something state unconditioned or something like that. It just I'm just I'm loading it. I'm loading the abstracts. I have to remember which one this was. Uh, for action planning and system object. Networks, which Okay, yeah, so I, there's a whole, like, there's the uh, wider family of these. Um, Poplin uh, has basically these parts, so it's definitely using the behavior clone prior, it looks like, and then it's using the action as a sort of a planning, fine-tuning step, um, and then it's backing that up into the agent. Um, it's not using a value function uh, extension, it looks like, uh, and it's not doing it offline. Um, so I'm not, like, what I have on screen here is in no way like our contribution. Um, this is just a couple of variants on a recipe that's used in probably like a half dozen papers um, with different uh, nuances and, and tricks. Um, and I think Poplin, yes, is like a, a good direction to look into. And, and I'm quite curious into sort of, uh, once we learn offline, pushing it to continue learning online. And I think Poplin probably provides some, some good directions for that as well. Yeah. And uh, just one more thing, but I think that is similar to what the others have been saying already, I guess, that uh, in this algorithm, there is basically nothing that prevents uh, the agent to go somewhere it doesn't know, right? Like, uh, it doesn't, for example, in, uh, I don't know, moral or what is the other one, Mopo or something? 
Um, they basically, uh, in the one way or the another, the other basically explicitly destroys the agent to visit areas that it doesn't go according to some sort of uncertainty measure or whatever, right? And, uh, yeah, so more or less people will, will use an explicit penalization to, on the uncertainty and the ensembles. And this guy uh, indirectly uses the ensembles by uh, sampling a consistent ensemble head. And so what happens is if your ensembles sort of really disagree about a direction you're going in, you're going to get relatively inconsistent plans, um, which probably won't average out to the mean uh, in practice. Um, and hopefully, when you take your average over your uh, reward, and I think this line could also be sort of improved, you could um, penalize on the variance as well here to discourage trajectories that sort of depart from the support of, of what the, the reward function used. So it's not as explicit, but the ensemble is leveraged, and, and the ensemble is important. Like, if you don't use an ensemble here, um, you won't get as good performance. Right. But I agree that like the, the moral and mopa ones are, are more explicit and more formal. Um, and this is sort of another one of the shortcomings of, of this work is to like more explicitly, uh, or not shortcomings, but one of the directions we want to sort of go in is to more explicitly leverage the, the variance estimation over the ensemble to penalize uh, directions. In practice, this wasn't necessary on these tasks, but I think as we push it more into, con into more constrained tasks, that'll be sort of a, a good follow-up. Yeah, I think I have to admit that I didn't pay attention to this detail there, that you say use consistent ensemble head throughout trajectory. Uh, what, what, it, what precisely do you mean by that, with that sentence? So there's sort of two approaches that model-based approaches have used to do um, uh, ensembling. Uh, either they sort of, I think PETS does this, they ran at each step, they pick a different head from the ensemble, and this kind of creates these relatively noisy trajectories. And then the PDDM and, and so MBOP, which is sort of PDDM derivative, um, take a consistent head and then stick to that one head throughout the whole uh, trajectory. And so this is sort of a design decision. I actually, we didn't try doing it other, uh, differently. Uh, I think in discussions with Anusha, she said this seemed to work better than, than randomly resampling the heads. Um, but I don't have like strong empirical grounding for that. So when you say consistent, that you basically just you, you, you sample one ensemble and you stick with it when you unroll it. Yeah, correct. Cool, and I, I actually have to run at 5 p.m., so I'll, I'll move forward through these slides to sort of show some videos. Um, so, so once we've had, we have this sort of uh, standard planner, we also show, and we'll show that in the experiments afterwards, that we can do zero-shot transfer, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, just instead of optimizing for the base reward, we're now going to mix in another uh, reward objective, and then we're going to have this kappa, uh, kappa constant that we can use to sort of uh, move between the original reward and this sort of new reward function, which is either going to be a goal-based reward, like move towards a specific uh, location, or maybe a constraint-based uh, penalization reward that's going to discourage you from doing something. So really quickly, we have some results uh, comparing MBOP to behavior cloning to the data performance. So in green, we have the, the performance of the data empiric, like if we just look at the cumulative returns in the data set. So that's obviously pretty consistent. And as the data set gets bigger, so to the right, it's more and more data. Uh, it's just as variance goes up a little more. Uh, the BC uh, policy is is in whatever color this is. Sorry, I'm not good with colors. Um, so we see it eventually sort of matches the, the data performance on, uh, on cart poll. On other ones, it eventually sort of gets pretty close to MBOP, but it's always a bit lower. Um, but it's also never nearly as good in sort of very low data regimes. So this is 5,000 uh, steps, which corresponds to five episodes of, of cart poll or five episodes of, of Walker. Um, and here we see that sort of the... Cloning can get just as good as the data, but you really need the combination of all three to get near optimal control um, using sort of so, such a small amount of data. Um, obviously, as you push the data up in some of these tasks, like BC sort of gets pretty close. Um, sometimes MBOP maintains sort of a strong lead. It really depends on the task, and I don't have like a good generalization of this um, to propose. Uh, Cart poll is particularly hard because it's not just a cyclical control task. There's a swing up phase and then there's a stabilization phase. So maybe that requires something more nuanced than something maybe like a quadruped where you, once you kind of get the gate down, um, it just works. Uh, we also ran this on some D4L data sets. People are familiar with uh, that. We show that it works uh, somewhat better than MOPO uh, and, and MVPL, uh, which are some sort so of MOPO is this um, model free training from model, and MVPO is. 
I forget another approach. <laughs> I'm losing in my head. I'm um, going to show that it's more more performant uh, on not even on average, but almost always, as long as we have decent data. If we have random data or sort of overly uh, bizarre data, um, then sort of other approaches might work better. Uh, uh, and so we show some some results of the zero shot transfer approach. And what's interesting here is that uh, if we constrain a cart pole, for example. So either say to the left or the right of the of the track, um, then it'll sort of learn to plan in a way that'll respect that constraint, and so it'll consistently start the swing up to the right or to the left uh, to to respect the constraint in the future, um, relative to sort of if it's unconstrained, then it kind of sometimes swings up to the left or the right depending on initialization, um, and then we show that with quadruped we can encourage the the agent to move backwards or right or left, and that this will um, you know that we can actually sort of I mean, influence some control over the agent. Obviously, because of the BC prior, it's less happy about going backwards than it is about going forwards. Uh, but it, we have some other relations that we didn't put in the paper where we remove the BC prior, um, and it does a better job of sort of respecting things if it's been trained in the high data regime. Uh, and then I have this video that sort of shows, I don't know how well this will stream. Um, And so in, in the lowest uh, re data regimes, we're talking something on the order of 50 seconds of data. And so this is the, the control running with the equivalent of 50 seconds of experience if it were a real system. Obviously, this is all in simulation. So there's like we need to test this out on some real systems to see how much this is just overfitting. Uh, but it's, it seems encouraging. Uh, and so in Carpool, you don't really see the nuance. But in something like Walker, you'll see that with sort of very little experience, you get kind of this. Uh, inconsistent gate that sometimes fails and ends up walking on its knees. And then as you add experience, you're going to get, so it's always a weird gate, but you're going to get a more consistent gate that never falls. And so this is quadruped with 100 seconds of effective wall time experience. So the gate's functional, but you can see that it kind of isn't as smooth and it has a couple weirdnesses to it. And then if you add in sort of three hours of experience, then you just get a smoother gate, um, slightly more speed, and yeah, just more stability in the system. And so as, as we sort of eventually add constraints to the tasks, this is the constrained left and right cart pole. So we see they kind of each one swings to one side and then stays on, on one side or the other. Um, it's not as good as a controller. Like finding the trade-off is not always easy. We also show that we can do more weird constraints, like we constrain uh, Walker to maintain his torso height below a certain threshold. And so this is the exact same controller, just one with that constraint and one without the constraint. And so in the bottom right, it was unconstrained, sort of hopping around, and then it's kind of walking on its knees to respect the constraint in, in the top one. And we can see sort of, this is uh, walking left or right in the immediate frame, not in the global frame. So if it deviates, it doesn't sort of track a uh, constant left vector or right vector. But we can see that it sort of has this functional but kind of uncomfortable left and right gate, and then an equally uncomfortable uh, backwards gate, which we'll see in a second. So backwards is definitely not what it's happy doing. Um, but we thought it was interesting to see that like, it nevertheless is still able to find a control trajectory that does manage to make a backwards gate, whereas like it's definitely not trained on data that does that or, um, or is sort of primed to do that. I'm supposed to meet with someone a minute ago. Let me see if I can just send an email really quick to warn them that I'll be late. We kind of overran our time. Give me two seconds. Uh, and so yeah, th there's some a bunch of future directions, like I mentioned, um, around uh, you know ways to make it more stable or or ways to uh, to sort of make the trajectory optimizer be a little more reasonable and sort of uh, more, uh, I'd say more reasonable in ways that it's like leveraging uncertainty, like Felix mentioned, um, or not relying on the prior so much. Just five minutes late. There we go. That is sent. OK, I am now no longer responsible. Um, and looking at more complex models and priors as well. So like right now, these simple feed forward neural nets, they're pretty straightforward, but there's energy-based models or autoregressive models or sort of structural and physical priors that could make learning these models way more efficient. Um, and then we could sort of uh, continue improving the, the model-free policy um, while we're training 
Uh, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, and then sort of parallel improvements around the switching between a model-free and a model-based policy that I think, uh, you know, Poplin looks at it a little bit, and I think there's a bunch of stuff to be done in that space. Uh, there you go. So that's our presentation. Uh, I guess we have three minutes for final questions, if, if anyone has any. Uh, I don't see anyone uh, asking question. Uh, there was one question on if the the uh, optimizer is modulating a parameter. I'm not sure I understand that one. That is related to the question that I asked. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess if there is uh, no more question at this point, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for having me. And uh, like, yeah, definitely see this. So the, the code, sor the source code will hopefully be out in a couple um, in a couple weeks. I hope we'll have something interesting. Uh, so you know, I'll I'll probably put it on Twitter and feel free to play with it. And also feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, and this is sort of a, I wa I wanted to put out the fact that a model based approach could be good for offline learning. Um, but there's definitely a bunch of ways you can improve it uh, beyond this. So see this is like a sort of a first proof of concept, not as like a, a finalized algorithm or a, a sort of truth, absolute truth of how you should be doing things. Cool. Yeah, we have a team here uh, working uh, also at the intersection of offline and, and model-based area. So uh, it's quite cool to see this, uh, this cool. bit, your bit of work and how it fits with, uh, with the rest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks but I, all the questions and criticisms are, are valid, and I, I agree with uh, all of them. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's shortcomings, and there's stuff to be done. Cool. 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 Well, thanks, thanks for having me, and uh, have a good afternoon, everyone, and uh, stay in touch. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for, thanks. Bye. for the talk. Bye.